Uh, translators, you ready? Here, okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, is this working? It's okay. Uh, how many people were at my last presentation here? About half or so. Okay. I talked a, there'll be a little bit of overlap, but I'll try to keep it kind of minimum. So I'm Roger. I, 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 are we doing, I guess we're not doing an introduction. I'll, I'll just introduce myself. At the last uh, presentation, I had this wonderful introduction, but he's left, so I guess I'm on my own this time. Um, so um, my field is um, what I think of as complex, IT complexity analytics. And what that field is about, there are a lot of people studying complexity. There's whole schools that study complexity. But the way most people study complexity, the way just about everybody that I know studies complexity, is they're asking the question, how do systems behave as they get more and more complex? So the complexity of the system is understood to be something that's going to happen, that's a given. And their question is, how is the complexity going to affect the behavior? From my perspective in complexity analytics, I'm asking a very different question. And uh, this makes me very, very few people are asking this question. That question is, we know how IT systems are going to behave as they get more and more complex. They're going to fail. We know that. We don't need to spend a lot of time studying that. And I'll show you some data to support that. So the question that I'm asking is, how can we use our understanding of complexity to understand how to keep systems from getting complex or to keep them from getting any more complex than necessary? Because, of course, you know, it's going to be some complexity. Complexity is a relative term. But what we want to do is make the systems as simple as possible. And that's what I think of as the field of IT complexity analytics. And I taught a course in this at the Universidad de los Andes. Anybody here? take that course? Okay. Um, and I've done a, a number of talks on this. I've spoken at a couple of Gartner conferences on that. I've written um, seven books and uh, I'm an ISA fellow, for those of you who are familiar with ISA, for my work in this area. So that's kind of a little bit about me. Uh, I'm going to compare, start out by comparing two different approaches to developing large IT systems. I should also start out by saying that the problems that I'm looking at here are really specific to very large complex systems. And I'll show you more about that in a moment. This is our standard approach to developing IT systems, the one that all of you learned in school and the one that all of, mo almost all of your organizations use, where you start out by um, somebody does a business architecture and that business architecture is thrown over the wall to the IT people, and the IT people then develop a technical architecture that, in their opinion, implements all of the requirements of the business architecture. And then there may be another group where they take that architecture and throw it over to the data people, and the data people end up uh, implementing a data architecture. They figure out how is all that data going to be stored and what databases, what partitions, blah, blah, blah. So what you end up with in virtually every system, every methodology today, is you end up with um, essentially a, uh, a horizontally partitioned architecture where you have some degree, and it's called even partitioning, is, a, is, is probably pushing the word a bit. But you've got a separation, some kind of a horizontal separation here. It's a fairly permeable separation, as you can see by all the crossovers there. And you've got an even more permeable separation at the top so you've got this kind of semi-horizontal, very permeable partitioning going on in your typical IT architecture today. I'm going to look at, uh, I'm going to compare that approach to the approach that I call the snowman architecture. And I'm going to look at a number of attributes, but I'm going to focus on one in particular that I'm extremely interested in that I think is very relevant to uh, Columbia. And I'm hoping that it will seem very relevant to you because I think it has the opportunity to really radically change how you, a, a lot of things, which I'll get into. But the six in total 
some of which I'll do very quickly. Are, and, and we could have chosen others as well, but these are six good representative system attributes that uh, many of us would think of we should get from a good system. Uh, first of all, the first one is success rate. And by success rate, I simply mean the chances that the system will be delivered on time and on budget. Not asking too much, you'd think. Uh, alignment, which is essentially how happy is the business with what you delivered. Agility is how easy is it to modify the system once it's been delivered, so the business makes some changes in how they do their business. How, how easy is, is it to modify the software? If you can't modify the software easy, then the, easily, then the business has low agility because they can't change their processes because they're dragged back by the software. So you need to be able to very easily modify your software to uh, allow the business to be agile. Reliability. Reliability has two two parts to it. The first part of reliability is the mean time between failure. How often does your system fail in a given unit of time, let's say per year? And the other measurement, that's a measurement that a lot of people think about, but the measurement that's probably much more important than that is how long does it take to get your system running again once it has failed? For many systems, you, know, you can tolerate a fair amount of failures as long as the recovery time is very, very short. But unfortunately, in many of these systems, we don't see that. And then the fifth one, which is really um, kind of something I've been focusing on a lot lately, and I'm going to focus a lot on in this particular talk, is the benefits to the local economy. Now, here I'm not talking about the direct benefits to your company that's implementing this type of an architecture. I'm really talking about the benefit to the Colombian economy as a whole. And then the final one, which in many ways is a conglomerate of all of the above and many others, is complexity. So what is the overall complexity of the system? So I'm going to compare the architecture I showed you earlier, which is your standard IT architecture, to the snowman architecture. And I'm going to look at it from all six of these different perspectives, with a lot of focus on the economy, economy one. Now, if you look at... Um, if you look at systems at different, of, of different sizes, okay, so let's say we look at a system that is a $500,000 system, a system that's a $1 million system, and a $5 million system, and a $20 million system, there have been a number of studies that all show a pattern somewhat similar to this. And if we look at all six of those attributes that I talked about, so here's a collection of those attributes for the $500,000 system, here it is for the $1 million system, and so on and so forth. This is the typical pattern that you see. You see that systems that cost around 500000 or less, or even probably up to a $1 million and less, have very high success rates. They're almost always delivered on time and on budget. Uh, they have very good alignment. The business is almost always happy with what's delivered. They have uh, good agility. They're easy to modify as the business needs change. And they, have, um, they, they benefit the local economy. By benefiting the local economy, what I mean is the chances are that if you're outsourcing that project, you're going to outsource it to a local firm as opposed to IBM or Accenture or Deloitte or Price Waterhouse. Okay? So the more, the, the, if, if you have a lot of money that's going to Price Waterhouse, I consider that a negative benefit to the local economy. Most of the money is going to support local IT consulting shops. I consider that a positive benefit. So that's what I mean by negative and positive impact on the local economy. And then finally, complexity. So again, these systems almost usually benefit the local economy because main, why is that? Because mainly because IBM and all those guys, they're not interested in the $500,000 project. You know, to get them interested, it has to get up into the $5 million range. So they're probably not going to be going after that. So that means that it's going to go to the local folks. Um, as the system gets better, it, bigger, I mean, um, you start to see at about a million dollars, you start to see an inflection point where um, all the first five of those all start to go down and the complexity starts to go up. So at that point, we start to see that not all systems are delivered successfully. You know, there's probably 10, 15 percent of them are failures at that rate or the agility is not quite there. They're still pretty good overall scheme of things, but they're not as good as they were before that. 
Uh, when we get into the five mil, and the exact numbers differ depending on the study, so I'm giving you kind of conglomerate numbers here. Once you get up to five million, you see a clear demarcation, a, t a clear loss in uh, success rates and all the good stuff. And, a, uh, and, and at that point, you know, of course, the large consulting companies are starting to pay attention to the whole thing. And also the complexity uh, is, is starting to dramatically go up. And I can talk later about how you'd measure the complexity. By the time the system has reached 20 million, and by some studies as early as $10 million, you know, the situation has come, become almost the exact opposite of where we started out. At that level, we have very, very low success rates. The chances that the system will be delivered on time and on budget are very small, unless we have grossly overestimated both the budget and the time deliveries, which many people do in an attempt to compensate for that. So, you know, we're, we're, we're delivering systems that cost way too much, that take way too long to deliver, uh, that have very poor alignment. You know, business is almost never happy with them. Uh, reliability is extremely poor. They take, they, ha <coughs> they fail frequently, and when they fail, they take a long, long time, sometimes hours or even days. I've seen some banking systems that have gone down that have taken hours to bring back up again. I've seen some that have taken days to bring back up again. Maybe some of you have seen those type of systems. That's totally unacceptable in that type of an environment. So this is the issue that we're struggling with. So the question that I have, we can't say that we're not going to develop these large systems that need to do a lot of stuff. But what I'd like to do is find a way to develop systems that are in this scale of what the enterprise needs, but that have these characteristics of what, of what an architecture, I believe, can deliver. And in order to do that, um, we need to rethink how we're building these systems. I will argue that the way that we're approaching IT together today because that doesn't scale up. As that gets bigger and bigger, the complexity goes up exponentially as the system size increases. And as the complexity goes up exponentially, all these other factors, which it turns out, I believe, are what mathematically we would call dependent variables, where complexity is the independent variable. All, it's, it's an inverse you know, dependent variable. These all follow the complexity almost exactly. So complexity is really the culprit. The reason that all these things, these problems are occurring is because the complexity is going up exponentially with the size of the system. And we can show that uh, if we, once we have agreed on a metric for measuring complexity. So here is the snowman architecture. And those of you who are at the last presentation got a preview of this. It starts out uh, where we identify the business functions. But in that way, it's similar to the way we would approach a three-tier architecture. But that's pretty much where the similarity ends. The next thing that happens is we uh, group them. Uh, we find logically related groups. And the, the grouping is using a mathematical process called synergy, which I have, if I have time, I'll talk about later. But I can at least give you references to that. So we find synergistic relationships between these business functions. And that becomes the top level of the architecture. Next thing that, well, not quite. There's one more thing we need to do. And that is to identify the dependencies between these business functions. So notice there's some similarities between this and the standard three-tier architecture. In both cases, we start out identifying the business functions. And in both cases, we need to understand what the dependencies are, to some extent, between those business functions. But in the snowman architecture, we introduce a clustering idea into the architecture. And that clustering allows us to relax greatly our identification of those um, dependencies between business functions. Because in the snowman architecture, we don't care about dependencies that exist within the cluster. We only care about dependencies across clusters for reasons that will maybe become apparent later. OK, so this becomes the top level of the architecture. The next level down, which is, uh, was in the IT system, you know, is the, mission, the whole thing of services down at that level. What we do is we, we create a, uh, a collection of technical, probably services, because I'm assuming we're doing this with a service-oriented architecture. So we have some service which creates a package of maybe internal services as well. So there's a package of technology 
that implements the business functions that we've identified in the head and doesn't deal with anything else. So we have a strict vertical partitioning. Remember in the last one, I, th I think I said, unless I was in my last talk, that there's this, did I talk about the horizontal partitioning in, in this? Okay, so you know, I talked about the horizontal partitioning that we see. We see that as well here, but we see, first of all, a much stricter horizontal partitioning. We don't have that big, um, that big kind of web of stuff, the permeable, that highly permeable membrane separating the two subsets. So we have a stricter horizontal, but we're also introducing a very strict vertical partitioning as well, which you don't see at all in the standard IT architecture. And then we, uh, we continue this partitioning. Oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. Then we introduce the messaging system, the asynchronous messaging system that will allow us, and what that's effectively going to do is allow us to implement the business functional dependencies at the technical level. So we, again, we're seeing each level of the architecture is a projection of the architecture level above it. We see that both in the co collection of what's happening in the, in the cluster or in that collection, and we see it at the, in the messages that are going back there. We don't introduce messages here that do not implement dependencies at the business functions. And then we uh, continue the most heretical idea of all, probably, is we then continue this projection right through the data. So we partition our data in such a way that the data can be accessed by the uh, functions that live at this level, but can't be accessed by anything else. So if anybody else, if, if, this, if this wants to get to this piece of data, it has no way of accessing that data. The only way it can get to that data is by making an asynchronous request to this snowman over here who will deliver that data if, if that snowman so chooses to do so. So this is the general uh, idea of the snowman architecture. So the next question uh, is, uh, here's a little bit more detail. Uh, so here you can see the head consists of the business. I think I've said all this. Um, I don't think there's anything. Oh, uh, uh, let me just, um, well, I'll come back to this one in a moment. Well, actually, we could probably talk about that now. Because I showed you in that previous graph how systems uh, suffer in terms of their deliverability, their success rates as we get $1 million is about the inflection point. So we want to keep these at less than a million or maybe $2 in size uh, for a number of reasons, but probably the most important one is because that's where we hit that, the danger point of the, you know, where the success starts to make that dip. If we can keep these systems at under a, hundred, uh, under a million dollars, then we're well into that area where we have very high success rates. That's the reason for that. It also turns out, uh, for those of you who are interested in agile development, that a million is kind of a magic number you see in many places in IT. And one of the places you see it is in agile development. Uh, well, I've, talked to, I've, I've talked to many uh, groups that do agile development, and there's a general consensus that someplace around a million dollars is where agile no longer scales up. You can, you know, it's, it's a great methodology for developing systems under a million, but once over that, you either end up with too many people in the group to communicate effectively, or you end up with too many groups and you have too many interdependencies between the groups. So if we can keep these, these snowmen end up being autonomous projects, and each one of these now is very amenable to using agile development in addition to its many other uh, good qualities. So this is a, a one possible example that I worked up for a pharmaceutical company. But it's basically just showing you that each one of these snowmen, which is probably obvious why I call them snowmen at this point already, but where each one of these uh, has some specific business identifiable role where it's, where it's doing some logically collected uh, set of business functions. And how, what exactly that would look like would depend on the analysis we would run for that particular organization. So why well, call that the snowman architecture? Well, you know, as soon as you start staring at these for any length of time, they start looking a lot like snowmen if they haven't already looked like that to you. So, and I've also found that the snowman metaphor is a very, a really nice metaphor for the, for the business. It, it's, um, it becomes kind of a viral metaphor very quickly. Okay, now it, it's hopefully clear that um, 
it's in architecting the head that we have the most opportunities to make mistakes. We can make mistakes doing the vertical projections as well, but in general, it's very easy to check the vertical projections to make sure that they've been done correctly. So, you know, you can take the vertical projections to an architectural review, and people can say, well, assuming the head was done correctly, the vertical partitioning has also been done correctly. But if you don't get the head right, then everything else is going to fall apart below that. So if you make mistakes up there, it continues at lower levels. Now, um, the way we approach this is uh, I talked a little bit about SIP, I think, in the last presentation. We, we, SIP is a mathematical process that, is, that uses this concept of synergy. And I'll just kind of briefly describe synergy here. So synergy is what drives the clustering of the head, and then the head drives the vertical partitioning uh, from every point beyond that. So generally what we do is we analyze a collection of business functions. We don't even need all the business functions. We just need a, you know, a fairly random set of maybe 10% of the business functions. And we ask the question, uh, from the business's perspective, are these two functions do we need them both? So if you go to the, if you go to the business and you say, I can give you A, but I can't give you B, or I can give you B, but I can't give you A, what's the business going to say to you? Are they going to say, okay, well, give me A now and give me B when you can, or is the business going to say, don't bother with A until you can give me B, and don't bother with B until you can give me A? If the first answer is the answer you get, then these are not synergistic. Did I get that right? Uh, if they say, don't give me A without B, then they are synergistic. And if they say, okay, give me A, give me B when you can, then they are not synergistic. That's the definition of synergy. So using that, and that turns out to be uh, a function that lives in a mathematical family of functions that are called equivalence relations. And equivalence relations have this really neat property that they can drive partitions. And the partitions that they drive have this neat quality that there's only one possible way to create the partition. You know, if you think about, if you were just kind of randomly or just trying to agree with your peers on which business functions to put in which head, there would be a lot of room for disagreement there. The promise of synergy is that there is no room for disagreement. And as what I've already said, makes an equivalence relation. So here are a couple of interesting properties about all equivalence relations, and since synergy is an equivalence relation, these are particularly, this are, are, these really help a lot in this architecture. The first one is that I've already said, which is there's only one possible outcome. So once you've identified a, a, a collection of items and an equivalence relations that run on them, and you do the partitioning with that, uh, then there's only one. We'll give you a quick example. Well, everybody in this room was born in some year, right? Nobody in this room was not born in a year. And if I created a function which was same year as, which I could plug any two people into, and it would return true if they're born in the same year as each other and false otherwise, that actually is an equivalence relation. The five properties of equivalence relations, what defines an equivalence relation, is that first of all, it is um, reflective, meaning that F, whatever F is, F of A comma A is always true with the same year as, everybody's born in the same year as themselves, right? So you can't possibly, that can't return false. Uh, the, the function is also uh, symmetric, meaning that if f of a, if f of a comma b is true, then f of b comma a is also true, and that's true of same, born in the same year as. If, if, you, if the two of you, if you are born in the same year as him, which may or may not be true, but if it is true, you must be born in the same. It doesn't matter which way we ask the question. So that's, uh, trans uh, that's symmetry. Transitivity means that if he is born in the same year as him and if he is born in the same year as you, neither of which, you know, either of those may not be true. But if those are both true, then he must be born in the same year as you. That's transitivity. And uh, it, it, it also requires that they be binary, that they take two arguments, which same year as does. And they also are, need to be Boolean, it returns true or false. Any function that satisfies those five requirements is called a equivalence relation, and it can be used to drive a partition. So for example, I could, I could uh, put you in that corner over there, and I could take you, and I could plug the two of you into that function, and if it returns true, I could tell you to stay in that corner. If it returns false, 
I could move you over to there, and then I could take you, know, you, and I could ask the same question of one person over here. If it returns true, I'll leave you there. If it doesn't, I go to the next one and ask the question again. If it returns true, you stay there, and if not, you go to the next one. That's basically the partitioning algorithm that's driven off an equivalence relation. Now, if you think about that, it doesn't matter which order I choose people in, it doesn't matter who drives the algorithm, there's only one possible outcome for that algorithm. We're going to end up with the same partition of people no matter which order we do it in and no matter who drives the algorithm. The only way we could end up with a different collection of subsets, which is a partition, a partition is a collection of subsets, would be if we introduce new people into the room who hadn't been there the last time we ran the algorithm, or if we um, changed the nature of same year as, if we redefined same year as. So that's just a general idea of partitioning through equivalence relations. And the nice thing about them is that there's only one possible outcome. You know, there's only, it doesn't matter who runs it, uh, unless somebody makes a mistake and doesn't understand the algorithm or doesn't understand the equivalence function, there's only one possible outcome. It's also rational in the sense that you can test it for validity. So at the end, when I've separated everybody out, into these subsets, and somebody comes up to me and says, I don't think you did that right. I don't think he belongs in that subset. We can test it. It's easy to test. We take him and we take somebody else, plug him into the equivalence relation. If it returns true, then the, now the only way you're going to convince me I made a mistake is to show me that either the function wasn't an equivalence uh, relation. If it's not an equivalence relation, then it, all bets are off from the partitioning or that I misunderstood it or something. But it's easy to test those ideas. And the third idea is this idea that I call conservation of structure. And conservation of structure, again, going back to that example, let's say that I took the first 10 people, I divided you into two groups, and I ran this algorithm on this group over here. I would end up with some subset of, of people who were born in the same year, it might be five, you know, it, it couldn't be more than the number of people in this half of the room, but it could be, it could be that, but it probably wouldn't be. It would probably be, let's say, five or ten subsets. But the guarantee is that if I now continue running it with the remaining people in this room, that I will never discover that the structure that I have so far identified is wrong. In other words, I will never find that an existing subset has been invalidated, and I will never discover that I have mis- um, assigned somebody to a subset. I will only, I will either add new people to an existing subset or I will add new subsets into the partition. Those are the only two possibilities. So we have this really interesting property of conservation of structure. The structure can be expanded but never invalidated if we're dealing with an equivalence relation. If we're not, all bets are off. So the fact that uh, synergy is an equivalence relation means that we have all of those properties. We can use it to partition things. We can, we can test the partition to see if it's valid. It's not dependent on what I think someplace should go and what you think someplace should go. It's dependent on what the algorithm tells us something should go. So there's no debate about it. And we can also do it very early with an incomplete collection of the things because of the conservation of structure. That's an amazing property, actually, when you think about it. And it turns out that you can do an, a, a, an amazingly accurate job of partitioning with an amazingly small number of the overall business functions. Probably 10% is more than adequate, which means that you don't need to get every single business function. You can start doing your partitioning. You can get 10% of them, do your partitioning based on that, and then add more on as you learn about them, but you've still got the structure already laid out. Very, very different than the way we approach IT systems today. So what are some of the benefits that we get if we compare the standard approach, which I call an SOA web, because it kind of looks like this ugly web, uh, versus a snowman architecture? And again, let me uh, re remind you that all of the advantages I'm talking about are only applicable to large systems. If your systems you're building are less than about a million dollars, you know, you probably, the snowman architecture probably isn't going to buy you anything, unless, of course, the system will someday grow to a much larger system. So I'm specifically talking about how do we get these large, complex systems that normally have all of these problems to exhibit all of the, pos the positive attributes that we have with much smaller systems. So this, everything, when I'm talking about, 
this has an advantage over that. I'm specifically talking about in the context of a large complex system, probably a 10 or 20 million dollar or more system. Okay, so the first thing we see is much higher success rates and that's driven by these studies that, you know, without going into a lot of detail, these studies show very conclusively that the systems under a million have very high success rates and the systems over about 10 million have very low success rates. So if we can partition these, uh, this large complex project into a number of smaller, essentially autonomous projects that are just hung together through some asynchronous messages, a very small number of asynchronous messages, then we essentially have a system which looks a lot more like a number of small systems than a single large complex system. So we're, we're, our, our snowmen are generally in this region where we expect that the vast majority of them are going to be delivered successfully, unlike the large uh, complex IT system. The next is the uh, business alignment. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems that we have with these large complex systems is that the requirements for these systems are a nightmare. I was looking at a system not too long ago that was a, probably going to be about a $50 million system for a state government in the United States. And the requirements document for that system was a foot thick, probably over 1,000 pages. Now, what are the chances that, a thousand, that, th that those requirements accurately reflect what the business needs? There's almost no chance of that. Nobody could even figure out if it was true or not because nobody can, nobody can can do the kind of complex analysis that would be necessary to match those up to the original business need. It's, it would just, it's just inconceivable that those requirements have any degree of fidelity to what the business actually needs. And of course, if they don't have any, if they don't have strong fidelity to what the actual, the business actually needs, everything from then on out is going to be a failure. You know, we don't even know what the business needs, and now we've got all the additional complexity that is introduced as we kind of go down and go out. So, you know, that's, that's a huge problem. So, in the snowman architecture, we can leverage that conservation of structure that I was talking about, which is a byproduct of synergy being an equivalence relation. We can basically determine the vertical structures with a small number of business functions. And once we've done that, now we can do the requirements gathering after we've done the partitioning. That's an amazing uh, ability to do that because now what we're doing is we're not trying to gather the requirements of this whole mess up here. We're looking at one vertical partition in isolation and understanding what are its business requirements. Its business requirements are probably 10 or 15 pages and that's something that's well within our ability to manage. So the chances that we have high, what I call high fidelity, a high matchup or high alignment between the business require, between the requirements that we've been given and the actual business need are much stronger in this vertically partitioned architecture. And we also have a different kind of alignment. We have this vertical alignment as well. That not only is there an alignment between the business requirements, but we actually have this physical vertical alignment that, that is very strong, which of course is totally lacking in this architecture. Agility is the next issue. So agility, reminder, agility is about uh, how easy is it, does the system as a whole support changes to the business or does it inhibit changes to the business? And in this type of an architecture, I'm sure any of you who've ever been involved in this type of an architecture know that that is not a architecture that encourages business change because what happens as you try to change a business function, it's dragged down by this whole web of um, technical stuff, which itself is dragged down by a web at the data level. And to make a change there is just almost impossible because that change ripples out into everything else and it impacts who knows what other business functions. So it's very, very difficult to make changes. In the snowman architecture, in contrast, uh, because of the synergy analysis, it's highly likely that if you're going to make a change in any one business function, that that change is the other business functions that are going to be impacted are in the same snowman, so they're in the same head, effectively. And what that means is that in, in general, in the worst case, if you have to make a change to the business processes, which are going to be the head of the snowman, the worst case is, because of the strong vertical partitioning, 
that everything that needs to be modified in the technical level lives here, and everything that needs to be modified at the data level lives here, and the chances that that's going to adversely affect anything else are very, very slim, because the only thing that connects this to anything else is these very, very loosely coupled asynchronous messages, which are the loosest possible form of coupling. You know, most people talk about synchronous messages as being loose coupling. Well, compared to synchronous messages, asynchronous messages are an order of magnitude less, uh, less strongly coupled. Uh, reliability I talked about. You know, reliability, I just kind of focus on the downtime issue here. You know, when one of these um, things goes down, the chances are the whole system is going down because there's this whole web of dependency and there's no way to, to kind of protect the system from anything else going down. So frequently outages of this type of an architecture are catastrophic. You don't often see local you know, outages of a, of a system or something. It's very common that the entire system goes down or huge portions of the system. In the snowman architecture, because again, we've got protection to the asynchronous messaging and the strong vertical partitioning, it's possible that that whole snowman will go down, but that's generally the worst case. And even that, if it goes down for small amounts of time, that's not even going to be noticeable because of the fact that we're going to be queuing up the messages asynchronously and short outages won't even be noticeable. Not only that, but we can also architect the system quite easily with shadow snowmen. So to bring the whole system back up, even in a total catastrophe, is very, very rapid. Whereas trying to figure out how to architect this system over here for fast recovery is just about impossible. OK, so this is actually the one that I was hoping to talk about the most. Let me see what my time is here. Although it's hard to tell because we're starting so late. But, um, and this is really the, what I see as something that could radically change the way the whole IT ecosystem in Columbia works. Right now, you know, if you're doing these, if a, if a company like a bank or a governmental agency is planning on doing a large IT project, by large, I mean, let's say $20 million or more, the chances are that that entire project is going to be bid out to a foreign consulting company and it's going to be bid out en masse. And if any money at all goes to the local economy, maybe 10% of that will trickle down to some local people that they will use. But the vast bulk of that money is going to go to the uh, consulting organization. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one that's fairly obvious, I think, is that in general, and I don't know if this is true here, but it's true in the US, and I suspect it's true here as well, is you can generally guess, if you're trying to estimate how much it's going to cost you to bid on a project, so you know, a company wants to bid out this project, you're a small independent consulting company, you want to bid on it, you can generally assume that the cost of responding to the bid is someplace around between 1% and, let's say, 2% of the value of the contract. So that means if you're looking at a $20 million contract, the chances are it's going to cost 1% of 20 million is um, 200,000, right? So we're looking at, am I doing the math right? So you're looking at about $400,000 in costs to put in a bid on a $20 million contract that you're probably going to lose because you're going to be fighting against all the big consulting companies. So there are not very many f uh, five or 10 person consulting organizations that are in a position to even bid on a contract like that, even if you thought you could get it. Just you know, four hundred thousand dollars with less than a twenty percent chance that you have, and probably much less than a twenty percent chance you get the contract. I doubt that there's anybody, any companies here that would take that kind of a risk. On the other hand, if we can break these projects down into these vertical, these uh, autonomous projects that are vertically partitioned, and as we said earlier, we want to keep those below a million dollars. Now you're looking at projects that are well within the scope of almost any local consulting organization in Colombia. So if we can take the projects from this type of an approach to this type of an approach, now this requires, this is not just a magical thing that's going to happen. If, we're, if this is to be accomplished, it will only be accomplished through a lot of preliminary collaboration between the large IT consumers, like the banks, the insurance companies, the government. I mean, think about your government. You know, your government is, is implementing a lot of, of IT projects that are over $20 million. This is your, your government, and almost all of that money is going to foreign consulting companies. Almost none of that money is benefiting the local IT economy. 
So what does that mean? It means that, you know, it means that we've got a very poor, we have very low nurturing for the local IT economy. If, in, if what would be much healthier is if we had a lot of consulting companies in the 5, 10, 20 person, maybe 100 person range, and we had a very healthy ecosystem of that, and that that's where this money was going. That money would be hugely beneficial to supporting this type of an ecosystem. But it requires collaboration. It requires the big software consumers, the banks and insurance companies, to buy into the strategy. And it requires the small consulting companies to kind of understand how they would play in this kind of a world, which is not super complicated, but it does require some collaborative uh, communication and coordination. But hopefully you can see that if we, even if you could just get the government to buy into this, just think about how much more money would flow in a different direction. Like when I was teaching at the University of the Andes, my observation was that the, most, uh, the, the jobs that the students wanted the most were the big consulting companies because that's where all the IT money is going. Well, think how different that whole thing would be if almost all of the uh, money that was flowing into the IT community was going into small companies, small consulting companies. Suddenly you'd have you know, the students competing to either start or become part of small IT consulting companies. And think what that would do to the creative brain power that overall would be represented, whereas now what you have is basically you know, the brain power is kind of sucked up by the big consulting companies where it's essentially stifled. I and mean, the, you know, the big companies have no interest in doing something like this. As, a, as an aside, I've had a number of conversations with the big consulting companies trying to convince them to buy into this approach. And uh, the, where the, conver the, the where the conversation always ends is, you know, like I'll explain the mathematics to them. I'll explain the benefits. They buy into all that. You know, I've had these conversations with a number of these big consulting companies. They see the benefit. They see the benefit to the, to the consumer. All of that they buy into. But then at the end, they look at it and they say, well, why would we do this? This, this hurts us. But we get hurt by this. We no longer get this contract. Now we have to split the contract up into 20, and if we're lucky, we get 10% of it. So they have no, no, no desire to do that, and that's where it always ends. You know, their interest... You know, one of the things you need to ask yourself if you're a big uh, IT consumer is, is your consulting company's interest in your interest? And this is a case where it's clearly not. Their interest is to make things as big and complex as possible. Your interest is to make them as small and simple as possible. And the interest of your country is to make them as small and simple as possible as well. I, I gave a talk yesterday at the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm hoping to seed some ideas there that, you know, we could build on this. It would be transformative. It would transform so many aspects of the IT ecosystem in this country. Okay, now complexity. Uh, I'm not, I don't have time to really get into the complexity metrics, but what I can pretty much... Uh, am I running out of time? Are we okay? Five, four minutes? Okay. So, okay, I won't get into this. Let me just uh, say that if you do metrics on this, you'll find that these systems are far more complex than these systems. Uh, I've got some papers on that, but I want to leave at least a little bit of time for questions. So if you kind of look at all these attributes, uh, in everything that we care about, um, this approach delivers low value. Again, talking about these large IT systems, not talking about $100,000 systems. But these large IT systems, all of the attributes we care about do poorly here, and all the attributes we do care about do well here except for the ones that we don't care about, which is complexity, which not only do we not care about, but that's a bad attribute. That does very well here and very poor here. So I think that there's a lot of, hopefully there's a lot of, at least if you don't come up with anything else, at least you, know, you should be thinking about, you know, maybe there's something to this and it's worth at least taking another look at. Okay, I think that that's pretty much where I'm going to end uh, here. Uh, hopefully that's given you enough uh, ideas, and I'd like to at least have a couple of minutes for questions. And um, so if you, if you uh, are going to ask a question, um, use the mic so everybody else can hear you. And if you're going to ask it in Spanish, give me a little heads up so I can put on my headset here so I can understand the, uh, what the translators have to say. So any questions? Anybody? I see a hand. Yes. 
I should apologize in advance to anybody if you happen to be here from a large consulting company. Um, mine, mine is just a comment. Um, I I really like your your comment as far as the um, the effect on the local economy, and um, I I've been in conversations uh, and I've been in meetings with people, for example, IBM, uh, big consulting company, and when you talk to them about just doing anything on a smaller scale for smaller consumers, they but what exactly what you just said? They don't care. That's why they have uh, partners all over the world. They basically just you know, hey, you can go to this guy. But they only care about the big guy. So uh, just and they're not, going to show you how to break that down not not at all. And even if you and, and we've done it before, where you basically just on, on numbers and you're like, there's a big benefit for you guys right here. They don't really care. Their business has always been just big enterprise. So they're not you know they're not even thinking about that. And in a country such as Colombia, if you're able to just uh, really start basically just structuring like this, then you're able to. Um, just like you said, keep the money here. But I just wanted to make a comment on that because I've seen it back in the States and I've seen it time and time again where a lot of those big consulting companies, I know a lot of people in there, they don't really care. I mean, if it's a, a smaller project or whatever, they'll just kind of, you know, ignore it and, and just keep on going. So it's probably, I should probably point out that I used to work for IBM before I started Object Watch, so I kind of know how they think. I, and I don't mean to pick on IBM. All these consulting companies are the same. You know, it doesn't matter. So, you know, these names are just just random ones. You could be talking about any of them. Any of the big five, big ten. Yes. Thank you. Your hand? Eh, buenos días, mi nombre es Carlos Ar mi nombre es Carlos Alberto Quiñones y mi pregunta es ¿por qué en el Snowman o, o no sé cómo se evidencian las relaciones? Digamos, la cabeza tiene, tiene sus cositas, eh, el, el cuerpo y, y la, todas las bolas tienen internamente, se componen de partes. ¿Cómo yo evidencio en el Snowman esas relaciones? O no sé si, o por qué no se relacionan en el Snowman. En el dibujo no veo que, que la base de datos se relacione con pues, digamos, ¿por qué las líneas verdes punteadas se desaparecen totalmente en el snowman? Okay, that's a great question. Um, they don't, they, they don't really disappear. Uh, some of them disappear. The ones that disappear are the ones that are internal into the snowman. Okay, those all disappear because basically they are not part of the high-level complexity. They're kind of part of what I think of as the implementation complexity. Uh, complexity in the metric that I use is driven by two factors. One is the number of functions in the thing that we're measuring, and the other is the number of dependencies between that thing and something else. So I don't even look at um, what the few people who are looking at complexity, most of them are what they're looking at is the complexity of code. You know, they're putting code through some kind of analysis and looking at branching statements. I'm looking at architectural complexity, so I only focus at this level. And um, at, my, at my level, it's not important how these, for example, here, the fact that I've got three things here and four things here and two things there, that, that's an irrelevant to me. What's important to me is that the boundaries that are defined up there are the boundaries around here. Rather, these turn out to be two, four, six, eight, or ten things I don't really care about. What I do care about is that what's in here is what's necessary to implement what's up there and nothing else. This implements nothing else, and there are no outside dependencies except for those that are reflected in the, in the business dependencies. And those business dependencies then become reflected in here. So it's not to say that there aren't dependencies inside here. It's just that at this level of architecture, they're not important to us. They will be important to the people implementing this, but they're going to make a lot of choices that we don't really care about at this level. We don't care if they choose to do it as four internal services or eight internal services. The only thing we care about is that the vertical boundary that was established at the top projects cleanly, neatly, and completely through the entire other two levels. The, this is the last question. We have to change to the ordinary activity. Okay. So one more question you said? 
No, no more questions? No more questions. Okay, no more questions. Uh, maybe you, if you can stay up the end of the day here in the Casa de la Cerveza for networking, maybe you can share. I don't know. You yeah, well, we, I have another talk, right? And that's yes, the, right now in five minutes you have another talk. Not here, right? Uh, not here. It's uh, in the college. Yeah. Okay. And okay, that's more of a business talk on the cloud, so I don't necessarily recommend you all attend that. Okay, so no other questions. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully we'll get to continue this dialogue. I'm trying to work with, uh, in fact, the, the ministry that set up this conference would be an ideal group to, to, to help coordinate some of these ideas. So maybe we can, um, I'm hoping now they can continue some of these discussions with them, and maybe some of you will be part of those discussions in the future. Thank you all for coming. I hope this was of interest to you.